upwards and onwards. A um, couple of things that we left off last time, um, important uh, bottom spaces. One important bottom space uh, that we left off last time was the civil law spaces. Okay, so um, to define this, um, uh, just recall um, multi multi index notation, multi index notation. Um, you have some alpha being alpha one to alpha b, right? Um, you define the absolute value of the size of alpha as the sum of the alpha i's. Uh, all these guys are uh, rational numbers, okay, so they're one, two, three, four, five. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, when we write something like this, this v x alpha, what we mean, um, you've probably seen this before, we mean that you take um, you take the various uh, derivatives, right? Um, you take uh, yeah, the the alpha um, the alpha first derivative, the first variable, blah blah blah, the alpha deep, uh, you take the alpha d very uh, derivative in the in the d variable. Okay. So that's the that's the multi multi index notation. So we don't have to write this a lot. Um, okay, multi index notation. Right. You know, if I um, right, uh, if I alpha were one and two, then d x alpha would mean that you're differentiating with respect to the first variable once, and you're differentiating with respect to the second variable once. It's just a just a abbreviation. Okay. Um, here is the real definition: the notion of a weak derivative. So um, for f and LP and k, some natural number. Um, uh, so if for every multi-index alpha um, of size less than equal to k, um, there exists a g alpha in LP um, such that uh, g alpha phi, the integral of g alpha against phi equals negative 1 to the uh, size of alpha f uh, times the g alpha derivative of phi like this. So if there exists some g alpha in LP such that this happens, um, for all for all p that are compact, compactly supported and infinitely differentiable, um, then we say uh, then we say f has weak derivatives um, in LP in LP. Um, up to order k, up to order k, and we say and write and we write um, the x f that the, we write the derivative is this g, g is that function g alpha. F has weak derivatives in LP up to order up to order k. So this is this is not a true derivative. Okay. This is not a real derivative, right? Um, these guys are in LP, right? These guys are in LP. They're not smooth functions, right? These these are. I mean, that's not an important thing, but um, they these guys are in L, these guys are only in LP. They're defined uh, almost everywhere. Um, um, but what they do is they act like derivatives, right? They act like a derivative would if you integrated it against a, uh, a smooth, compactly supported function. Okay. So this is, this is the key here, that the way they behave, if there's a function and it behaves like the derivative would behave, then we say um, the function has a weak derivative. Okay. Right, because look at this thing, right? Um, if, if there actually were, right, so if um, f had a, a sort of true derivative 
an actual derivative, um, d alpha xf, right? So in the in the in the old sense, suppose you have a function and it's actually differentiable, um, differentiable this many times, right? Then well, we would just we would just put that guy in here as our as our g g sub alpha, right? Why does why would this why would this hold then? Why would this hold? Why does this hold for an actual derivative? Why is it true that for, an, for a true derivative, true derivative, d alpha x f beta actually equal, actually does equal um, that for for uh, for phi perfectly supported and smooth? Uh, this should look sort of familiar. What do you? What is this? This is something you saw back in calculus one, two. Does it look kind of familiar? Let me get rid of. Um, so, what kind of statement in calculus two says if you're integrating something, it's okay to pass the derivative from one function to the other guy at the cost of a minus one at the cost of a minus sign. Integration by parts. Integration by parts, right? So all this is, is all this, you know, if you have an actual derivative by integration by parts in each variable, this statement is true. Okay. Of course, you're going to get some terms. You, you, you also get some error terms, right? The, the endpoint terms. But this, the phi are compactly supported, right? The phi are compactly supported, so when you take the limit of those improper integrals, those error terms vanish. Those zero terms are going to go to zero. Okay. So, um, right. So, as long as your function, as long as this guy is compactly supported, well, then you know those zero terms don't show up, and the only thing that shows up is is the statement about you know if you switch the derivative one for one for one side to the other, you do it at the cost of a minus one. Okay. So, so that's all. That's 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 what we're saying here. That the function, um, if there's a function that behaves as a true derivative would. If there's an LP function that behaves as a true derivative would, um, then we say that the function is, is weak differentiable, right? Has a weak derivative, um, has a weak derivative um, in LP of that, you know, in LP. Okay. So that's that's this is the notion of weak derivative. As, as, as I just said, a strong a, a strong derivative, an actual derivative, is a weak derivative. So just a definition at this point. 
don't worry, we're not gonna we're not gonna do much with it for now. Um, but this is this is a pretty important space in analysis, so we'll see this. You hear this one sees this all the time. Um, uh, for K that's not not a natural number. So for K that is just a real number bigger than zero, uh, one defines solo spaces, one has sort of a gen one generalizes the sum. Uh, so generalizing Analyzing to to k uh, just a real number bigger than zero, um, one has the following definition. So this is for people who, who are familiar with the Fourier transform. Um, so you don't worry about this if you haven't seen the Fourier transform. But um, it's possible to see it's possible to see that um, a function is in L two k. Um, so this is for k and n. For k and n, a function is in L2, L2k if and only if um, 1 plus c squared to k over 2 for the transform um, is in L2. Okay. So for, um, it's, it's possible to see this sort of thing. And so, um, so one generalizes. to k greater than zero using this definition. Okay, so so you can have you know L2 where k is you know like three halves. Well you just you just have you know, your set k equals three halves here and you say is this is this thing is the Fourier transform of f multiplied by multiply this by this in L2 Okay, so this gives you um, a way of defining sum of spaces for um, for fractional for so-called fractional k. Okay, we're gonna wait. We haven't done anything. We've just put out a bunch of bunch of definitions so far. Okay. So there's actually no there's actually been no thinking involved except for the statement about the um, integration of parts. Recognizing you know, what what is this definition? Oh, this is just saying that it will behave like like a true derivative would behave via integration of okay. 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 So I think that seems like they put glass or something on the boards. Spaces and ultimately, you know, our, our near nearby goal is to show that um, the dual space of LP is LP prime, where P prime is the conjugate uh, conjugate exponent. Okay, so uh, we're talking about dual modern spaces in general and specifically for LP. Okay, so let's recall um, let's just recall some definitions. Um, right, so one. Um, any so P bottom space P bottom space. Um, I I should say that it was a bit of a lie to say that I'm only eating rice. I, I was able to eat some tofu yesterday. <laughs> yeah, just to be completely honest. Yeah, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fall over. I am tofu. Um, so a linear function, right? A linear. Um, um, any? Oh, actually, uh, we'll do the complex this later. So any linear, any linear map from the bottom space into R is called a linear functional. Remember? It's called a linear functional, and we have this notion of. Um, of boundedness, right? Um, if there exists a M, um, 
trust that um, uh, LF is less than or equal to M times the normal path, the bottom space normal path. Right? So this is the LF is a real number, and this is the absolute value. So the absolute value of this is smaller than M times the bonnet space normal of F um, for all F and D. Then we say, say L is a bounded, bounded linear functional. L is bounded, just like that. L is bounded. Okay. Um, and we have the notion of continuity. The notion of continuity is just like, you know, or okay. Um, okay. Uh, we introduce a norm on um, so uh, let um, f be a bounded linear functional. Okay, let L be a bounded linear functional. B. Uh, we define the norm. We define the norm of B, the norm of L, excuse me, the I am, I am dying. Uh, we define the norm of L um, as, how do, we, how do we define the norm of L? Does anyone, does anyone know this? It's just the sort of operator, operator norm. Does anyone, anyone know how to, how to define the norm? The norm of L, a couple of couple of equivalent ways of defining it. Share. You you your hand moved. No. Not intentionally. I'm just a here. Your hand twitched. No. <laughs> Somebody smiled. William smiled. No. Um, okay. So does does anyone know? So basically, you you um uh uh well here here is one way. Okay. So you say I'm going to look at the supremum of the absolute values of the outputs. I'm going to look at the supremum of the absolute values and the outputs. Now, that looks like a bad idea, right? What would that be? Infinity. <laughs> right? So you don't want to do that, right? Because you could always, you know, you know, when you take f, you can multiply f by some number, and it's just going to get bigger since this thing is linear. Right? So you want to say, I, I'm going to constrain myself to the uh, unit, unit ball. So you scale it, you, you, you scale your functions so that they are of norm less than or equal to one. You say, um, right, because otherwise you have to multiply them by some constant, right? And it just get bigger. So you scale, you normalize guys so that they're inside the unit ball, right? And you, you take the absolute value of all values on, on the unit ball. Okay, and you take the supremum of all those values and you call that, you know, you know that um, we know that's, that you know, if the function, if the, uh, Thing is bounded that this is finite, right? This is it's going to be smaller than that m from above, right? So, um, so this is this is the norm. The, you, look, you take the absolute value of all the outputs when the inputs are constrained to the unit ball, and you say um, that's 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 my norm. Um, and uh, by linearity, it's easy to see. It's easy to see that um, uh, you could, you don't have to, you could just look at the, the shell, right? You could just look at the unit sphere, right? Whoops. You could just look at the, just look at the ones of norm one, right? You could just look at the ones of norm one, right? Just look at the ones of norm one, right? By linearity, right? Right. Um, and that this is the same thing, of course, as taking the supremum of all over all f uh, non zero of L f over the norm of over the norm of f. Right? It's obvious, right? Because if it's inside the unit ball, well then you multiply by some number to get it to the edge of the unit ball. And that's just going to make it bigger, right? So that the, the ones on the edge of the unit ball are going to have the biggest, biggest uh, absolute values anyway, right? It's not going to, it's not going to happen on the interior of the ball. Right? It's going to happen on the edge. So, um, you know, this is this that the, the norm. Uh, you can 
can get by constraining yourself to the to the edge of the ball, to the boundary of the ball. And then from here to here, of course, right, you can just say, well, right, I'm gonna look at F, I'm gonna look at L applying to any any non non-zero, any non-zero element, nor, any normalized non-zero element, right? Because that makes it a normal one. Right? And that's all I'm making here. So by linearity, there's there's these other ways uh, of thinking about um, thinking about the norm of the um, of the thousand linear function. Okay. And so you know you see that this thing, whatever it is, is going to um, be the smallest number that satisfies uh, this relation. Right? It's going to be the smallest bound uh, that works for all f. Am I going too slow? I think I'm going too slow. I'm going too slow. Close your eyes for a second. Uh, raise a finger that's going too slow. Raise a finger that's going too fast. Oh, it's just right for everything. Great. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so it is a um, an exercise, uh, easy exercise. See that um, this actually uh, is a norm. Thing is a norm, and so we um, we define uh, d star to be the set of all um, the set of all uh, bounded linear functionals so we define this to be the set of all bounded linear functionals with this norm and it turns out that this space um, it, so right now we, it's a normed, uh, norm linear space, a norm vector space, and what we're going to see is in fact um, the plane. Uh, we define this is called to be uh, is called the dual space, dual space uh, B. Okay. In fact, um, the star with this uh, norm uh, is a bottom space. So the dual of the bonnet space actually is the bonnet space itself. So you might, so it's sort of maybe the obvious question at this point is, what about the dual of the dual of the bonnet space? Is that, what, what, what should be your question at this point? What's a, what's a reasonable question to think? Is the dual of the dual of the bonnet space? The bonnet space. The the same space you started off with, right? Is it true that when you take the dual, is it true that the dual, the dual gets you back, gets you back to the original space? And the answer is no. Not, or the answer is not always. But under certain conditions, of course, uh, as you might expect, under certain conditions, the answer is yes. So um, you know, just just one observation. Um, we haven't really used the fact that um, this thing is a bonnet space, right? In the construction of linear functionals, we can talk about boundedness. All we're using is that there's a norm. We have a norm vector space, right? So this notion of dual space actually um, can be done in finite dimensional vector spaces, like in linear algebra. It would, it's not uh, completely unreasonable to introduce the notion of dual space. You can say, well, we've got this. Vector space. Let's consider the space of of, of, um, of linear functionals. Right? That turns out to be this other space, the, the dual space. So this, these notions are actually are pretty fundamental. Okay. What we we'll use the, the what we we'll use bottom for is of course to get that this thing is a bottom space. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, last time we we touched on this, but I want to I want to say it again in a bit more a bit more generality. Um, you have a linear functional um, on R space B. Um, 
then following our filter, um, when L is bounded, 2 L is continuous at every uh, at every point in the bottom space, 3 L is continuous at a single point in the bottom space. So all these things are actually equivalent to each other. Being continuous at a single point actually implies continuity at every point. Um, so all these things are the same. So, um, you know, Eric, I think, you know, basically, this is the, the one that, that Eric uh, basically solved last time. Let me just put it up for completeness um, uh, in, in its full glory. Um, so, um, let me just show, uh, you know, this, of course, 2 implies 3 is trivial, right? If you're continuous at every point, you're certainly continuous at, at one point. Uh, 1 implies 2 is also trivial, right? Because um, to be bounded tells you that, um, that L of F minus G um, is controlled by some constant times the norm of F minus G, right? So that's, that gives you continuity right away. So, so this is trivial. It's also trivial because boundedness. So boundedness implies complete, implies continuity is trivial. Two implies three is trivial. The only one that's not trivial is three implies one, and it's, it's actually trivial also. Okay. So um. So I, I'm sure. So part of the trouble is that I've taught many. I've taught some of you before. I've used up all my good stories. I can't tell the same stories because I've really used them on you. But I'm going to tell the same story anyway for those of you who haven't had it before. Okay. So this is a story about, about Hardy, right? The, the great um, British analyst, you know, early 20th century analyst, uh, uh, you know, of the um, famous Hardy little book. Hardy is famous also for being the person who worked with Ramanujan. Uh, Ramanujan, who, uh, and sort of like the, the guy who recognized Ramanujan's talent. Um, so the story is that that um, Hardy, Hardy is giving a lecture, and um, and he comes to a point. And he says, "So it's trivial that something, something, something." something. And, and the student says, "Professor Hardy, is it true that that's actually trivial? Is that really trivial?" And Hardy thinks about it. And he walks around the room once. He walks around the room again. He walks around the room again. And then he leaves. He leaves the room that way. And 15 minutes later, he comes back. And he says, yes, it is trivial. <laughs> <laughs> and then he keeps on going. So, yeah, so probably in the meantime, he went to check, you know, to find a textbook or something, to find a book where it was done. Or maybe he went and worked it out, and then came back. Actually, yes, it is trivial. But that's a, that gives you a sense of what your are doing. So, um, so um, yeah. So, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, and I usually say at this point that um, I, I I actually met met little little Lid at one point when I was an undergraduate in a dream. Reading a book by Little Lid, and for some reason I constrained meeting Little Lid. Okay, so that's that's enough. Uh, 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 <coughs> suppose you know that f is continuous at a single f. We want to show that f l. Uh, suppose that we know that l is continuous at a single f. We want to show that l is bounded. Right. So v by one. So let's say that um, l is continuous at some F not in B. Okay. Well, you know what that means, right? Um, 
In other words, given any S1, this is delta, such that um, if f minus f naught is smaller than delta, then um, L of f minus um, L of f minus L of f naught is smaller than epsilon. That's the definition, that's the definition of continuity, of course. Right? Um, so what is that, think about what that says. Um, in other words, given any G of size smaller than delta, right? given any G of sm size smaller than delta, um, we know that um, um, L of F plus G minus, I'm sorry, L of F not plus G minus L of F not is smaller than epsilon. Right? Right? And we think of um, if F is close to F is close to close to F, that means that the difference is small. G is this difference. Right? So we're saying, let's look at that difference guy. Right? Yeah, this should be G, sorry. We know that given any g such that given any g that's of, of size smaller than delta, well then l of l of f not plus g minus l of f not is, is smaller than delta, is smaller than epsilon. Right. Right. Well, by linearity, um, by linearity, this is l of g. Well, if, if f is of norm less than one, then delta f is of norm less than less than delta, right? We know that for anything of norm less than delta, l of l of that thing is less than epsilon. Right? We just saw that. That's that's what it means to be, you know, the continuity continuity at f not gives us that. I'm being, I'm being a little bit sloppy here, but not, but not significantly sloppy. Okay, okay. So um, the point is that um, when we're talking about these star, the point is that when we're talking about these star, the bounded, bounded, um, bounded linear functionals on, on B, those guys are all continuous, right? They're continuous at every at every point. 
and anybody who is, is continuous at any at any single point is going to be a bounded bounded linear function. Okay. Okay. So now let's get to the hard one um, to show that the star actually is a bounded space. This is not really, um, don't worry, this is definitely not the hard one. This is the easy one. The hard one will be um, to show that um, the, 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 the more, more, most involved thing we'll do in this class, in the next class, maybe, would be to talk about the duality of LP. Okay. okay, but so let's go. Um, so we want to show, right, we want to show that if um, L sub n uh, in B, star is Cauchy, um, then uh, L sub n, so there, then there exists an L in B star, um, such that uh, the uh, operating norm um, goes to zero. Right? So that uh, L, L, L n converges to L um, in the B star norm. In the dual norm. Okay. So we start off with some Cauchy sequence, and we have to create we have to create this thing that they converge to. Okay. So um, um, what should it be? What should be? And the observation you want to make uh, is the following. Well, observe. Um, that, um, uh, given any f in B, Lnf is Cauchy in R. Okay. So the Cauchyness of, and we'll, we'll prove this. Okay, we'll prove it. We'll, we'll examine this. We'll, we'll take a look at this. But this is this is going to be a, a, a key observation, um, and it's a key but not complicated observation to say that well, if you have a sequence of these guys who are Cauchy, then you know, for any fixed f, then uh, L f is going to be Cauchy too. Okay. So um, right, so uh, why? Can I let you think about it? Maybe I'll let you. I think you can. You can actually do this. So think about this for for two two or three minutes. Yeah, this is this is yeah, just do this for practice to help you solidify your understanding of the norm of the function of the linear function. So maybe just one. Okay, turn to somebody else and say, here's what's going on, here's what it is. Yeah, turn to somebody next to you, please. Or your mom. And tell you you can talk to yourself. Right? <laughs> well, not to talk to Eric. <laughs>
So why is it why is it Jim? Why is it why is it completely completely obvious? Okay, this is this is how you want to think. Like you want to think why every time you're going through the book, you want to think why is this completely obvious? Why is this completely obvious? And the more you can do that, the more you can actually understand what's going on. I I can't do that for everything. That's that's the attitude that I take. Why is this you know, completely obvious? Why is it completely obvious? Does anyone can anyone tell me? Okay, let's look. Right, we're trying to see that that this sort of thing is, is small. We're trying to given an epsilon, we want an n such that that this thing is smaller than that epsilon. Right. Well, what do we know about this thing? Right. Let's let's just do some scratch scratch work. Just saying, um, take, take n so that m n taken of n implies that the ln times ln, the dual norm of this thing, is smaller than epsilon over the norm of f over the bond space norm of f. Right? Then ln f. Okay, so what's that saying? That says that you know, given um, remember we've got this sequence, we've got this Cauchy sequence of linear functionals, right? And we want to define the limit. Well, we know that given any f, ln f is a Cauchy sequence in R, right? Being a Cauchy sequence in R, it converges to something, right? So um, I'm going to erase this. Um, Um, so this is Cauchy and R, so ln f converges uh, the limit as on the 30 exists in R. Right? Call that call that ln f. Okay, so that's how we're gonna define how uh, that's how we're gonna define the the limiting uh, the limiting thing. And if you think 
about it, it's sort of obvious that um, that L is linear. So um, note that L is linear. Right? If I take um, right, if I take f plus g, right, L of f plus g. How do I get L of f plus g? Well, I'm going to take Ln of f plus g, and then take the take the limits of those times. Right? Well, that's going to converge to L of f plus L of g. Right? So it's sort of obvious that, that this that this is sort of same. So this thing, uh, this thing that we get by taking the pointwise limit actually is um, a linear functional, right? It is a linear functional. Um, uh, the only thing we need to check, there are two things we need to check. One is that it's a bounded linear functional, and two, that these guys actually converge to it in the, in the B star norm. Okay. We know that if we take any value, you know, L and F converges to L by definition, right? But we don't know that um, that L n converges to L in the B star norm. That's something. That's a different statement. Right? Converging pointwise doesn't imply converging in the B star norm. Okay. So um, okay. So there are two things. Um, two things we need to show. Um, one is that um, uh, one we need to show that L is is bounded. We need to show that L is bounded, and two, we need to show that L n actually goes to L in the B star norm. Okay. Okay. So um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we want to show. So remember, let's think what what bounded means. We want to show that um, that given any f in B. Norm, norm one that there exists a number, um, there exists some number m star m prime such that um, uh, L f is bounded by that m prime. Okay. Right. That's what bounded. That's what bounded means. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You say, well, um, we know that uh, that um, L n is a Cauchy sequence. Right? Well, L sub n is a Cauchy sequence in B star. Right. Right. Well, being a Cauchy sequence in B star. Um, that tells us that there exists some constant m. And actually, let me just call it m. It's going to be the same m. There exists some constant m such that um, right? this is just a metric metric space metric space statement. Right? You have Cauchy sequence. It converges. It's going to be bounded. Right? So we know that um, these guys are all bounded. And then we're just going to break it up into pieces. We say, well, look, um, LF, um, if we look at LF, uh, we know by the triangle inequality that we can take this as L minus LN, uh, N using linearity, uh, plus LN. Okay. Uh, so if I, uh, so if I triangle inequality, we have, we have this statement, and then what do we say? And then what do we say? Well, what can we do with this? This is smaller than n, right? Because the norm, right, this is smaller than the norm of Ln and the norm of F. The norm of Ln is smaller than m. The norm of f is equal to 1. Right. Right. 
choose f to the one. Okay. Okay, so that thing, this thing is, this thing is smaller than uh, smaller than m, right? And what do we what do we say about this thing? It converges to zero, right? We have the point wise we have the point pointwise convergence, right? L and f converges to L f. So this thing, um, as n goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, we see that L of f is going to be less than or equal to um, uh, is controlled by m plus any epsilon. Right? So small of that. Okay. Any questions? So, you know, trying to show that this guy is bounded. Well, we have pointwise convergence, and we also have um, the, the things that converge pointwise to this guy are our Cauchy sequence in our bonding space. And we put this, we you know, put this two things together, and we get that this guy is also also bounded. Okay. Any any questions? Are you all okay? Are you down? You seem kind of sad. Are you sad? No? Okay, good. So, yeah, we're going a bit slower than, than, I, than I expected, but this book is pretty dense. Um, so I think it's okay to go slow. And the homework problems are hard. We can stay in chapter one for a while, um, you know, sort of going through it and you know, doing more and more of the homework. In fact, this, this Set of homework problems in chapter one is is, is great. Um, it's a great introduction to a lot of important facts. So um, I don't mind sticking around in chapter one for a while. Um, I had an, an, an entire graduate course um, in algebraic. I had, a, I'm sorry, I had an undergraduate course during my senior year um, in algebraic geometry, where we we never we never exited chapter zero of Griffiths and Harris. So there's this book on algebraic geometry called Griffiths and Harris. And it cost at the time um, like eighty three dollars, which for me was like a thousand dollars. Well, anyway, it was a very expensive, book, like the most expensive book I ever purchased. Um, and uh, we spent the entire semester uh, in trying to do, trying to figure out chapter zero. Um, the professor was an algebraic geometer himself, um, and would often try to do things, uh, try to explain things in his own way, you know, and uh, you know, create his own proofs and stuff. And he was very creative. Uh, but often do a fail. <laughs> so you come in, you put all this stuff on the board, and, and you come to some point, like, get stuck. You could get past it. You could get past it. And he'd say, um, sorry, guys. <laughs> and then that would be the end. So that's, that's one, one classmate of mine who's a professor in, in, in Japan um, said, joked, uh, and said, that's, that's what we learned this semester. How to say, uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's not, it was, it was not a good course. Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah I, I think we'll probably spend another week or so on chapter one. Um, okay, so uh, part two, we need to show that um, ln goes to L and G star. Okay, so, um, right. so uh, right. what does that say? So that is, what do we want to show? We want to show that um, given any epsilon, okay. so what does this mean? Can anyone explain, explain to me what this means? Ln goes to L in, in B star. Let's just make sure that we understand the definition. Well, of course, you know, there exists an N such that N bigger than N implies that the he's not a normal this thing, and a smaller than epsilon. Right. Okay, but what does that mean? The fact for this to be smaller than epsilon, what does that mean? That means that for the be star normal to be smaller than epsilon means that Spencer? Yep. Alice? What does it mean? 
what's the base star what's the base star norm of the linear function norm? Remember? The soup on the on the on the on the edge, right? The soup on the boundary of the ball. Right? So what this means is that given any um, given any something in B of norm one, that L L n minus L of that F is smaller than epsilon. Okay. Okay, so just to unpack unpack what this what this thing is. Okay. Don't worry, yeah, it will become familiar, uh, become more familiar as time goes on. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So we're going to do this in sort of the same way. Um, uh, you can sort of see that we're we're going to play a similar game, right? We're trying try to control. We're trying to control this thing, right? Um, we have that L n is Cauchy, and we have that L n converges to L. Ln converges to L in, in the pointwise sense, right? That this that Ln minus L of F converges to pointwise. Okay. So um, so let's say so let F uh, be uh, norm equal to one, right? Um, since uh, Ln is Cauchy, you know, uh, so given that's on zero. zero. Um, Given that's one greater than zero, we know there exists an n such that m and n bigger than n implies that ln minus ln is smaller than epsilon, as usual. Right. Okay. So let's think about it. Um, so it's actually let me take epsilon over two, and you see why in a second. Um, then what we have is um, Part is controlled by the Cauchy-ness. This part 
we have to do it for each f, but that's okay. Right? We're just, we, we want to do it for each f anyway. Okay, and so you get that this thing is smaller than this one. So, right, and that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to show that given any uh, function of norm one, that this thing was smaller than this one. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, the e star norm is smaller than epsilon. The e star norm of the difference is smaller than epsilon. In other words, ln converges to L in the star norm. Yeah, Eric. The atom. If you don't like the atom, right? I'm I'm confused about how we could control the 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 end term when it seems like that's qualitatively no different than the end term. Like, why? What, what happened that let us do that? Yeah, so, um, okay, so you want to think, um, we are looking for a capital N, so that if N, little n exceeds it, then this thing happens. Okay. Okay. So, from the Cauchiness, we get an N such that if we have a pair of numbers that exceeds, exceeds that, then we have this control. Okay. Okay. Let's use that. That will be our that will be our n. Okay? So so we say as long as as long as um, n exceeds this n, exceeds this n, um, uh, if if m is also bigger than that n, then we have then we have this control. And you say, okay, let's go over right here, right? And let's look at, now we consider, remember we're just trying to make a statement about M's, okay? So, um, we say, okay, well, so, so for N bigger than N, we have that this is smaller than, smaller than this, right? And this is true for anything, for, N, for, any, for any M, but we, we say, take M to be also bigger, take M to be also bigger than N. Okay, so you want to think about them separately, right? Even though you get them at the same time, you 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 use the you use the n, and you um, you you say I I can that m I can let I can fix it wherever I feel like. Okay, is it is it sort of making sense now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. So um, right. We could have done it in the opposite way, right? You could say, you know, if you you know if we if we call this m, we would have done it in the opposite. We have said, you know, let m be bigger than n, and then we're going to fix an n. We're going to fix our n so that this thing is small. Okay, so that that's yeah, it's it's true. Neither of them is is uh, special. Okay. Does that does that clarify things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit peculiar. It's a bit peculiar. But yeah, you use the n from the Cauchy from the Cauchy Cauchy sequence. Okay, as long as my n exceeds that, as long as my n exceeds that, I'm gonna take my n, I'm gonna take my m so that this thing is small and then and then it works. Yeah, so this it may seem so it actually is logically sound, although it doesn't seem like it. it doesn't seem like it initially, but it is okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so I guess we'll stop here for today. I was hoping to get on to the uh, thing about dual spaces for LP, but I think we're out of time. So, so, yeah, so next lecture, um, try to read in advance um, the, the proof of LP and uh, you know, get up to the point. Um, uh, I think read, up, read carefully everything from here to um, uh, there's this last part of the text that talks about um, some problem of measure. Okay, so don't don't read that part. We'll do that part next week. But we'll do the LP space duality and possibly Hanbar Hanbar.